And, and there's so much within the text that we have drawn out of it and ministered to you. But this morning, the crux of the message from this text is what we want to deliver. And it says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. I need to pause a moment. And then I want to give you the, the title of this message this morning and you'll understand where we're pulling, what we're pulling out of this text. He said your sins have been your downfall. Notice, notice, realize there is no place in Scripture and the Word of God is truth. There is no place in Scripture that says or makes reference to anything like your righteousness is your downfall. Amen? Your sin is your downfall is what he said. Then he says, take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. We've been talking about how to pray, what to say, and I want to entitle this message, Repent in order to receive. Repent to receive. Repent to receive. If you want to receive from the hand of God, if you want to receive from the throne of God, if you want to receive the grace of God, repent to receive. And as we minister this morning, you'll, you'll see the scripture advocates that we live a lifestyle of repentance, a continual repentance in honoring and serving the Lord. In Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, so for yourselves righteousness. That word so, it means where you, where you uh, plow the field, you plow the ground, you drop the seed, you water, you tend to it, and then your crop, your fruit will come up, your crop will come forth. How many has ever heard that we reap what we sow? Well, that comes straight from the Bible. We reap what we sow, whether it's good or bad, we reap what we we sow. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. What does that mean? Let me continue reading. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. That's, this is what God wants to do, a shower righteousness. Thank God for the showers, the rain that we are having. And uh, I know there's flooding and this and that, but, but thank God for the rain. You know, I remember when there were so many people praying for rain, praying and praying and praying for rain for a number of years, and they thought our lake was going to dry up. Did you know there's nothing that I have found in the scripture that says we are supposed to Pray for rain. Here's what you will see in the scripture. You repent for rain. Amen. If you turn back to the Lord, he has promises he'll bless the land. You don't have to pray for rain when you live a lifestyle of repentance. As, as a nation, when a nation does that, the blessing is there. But when a nation is in rebellion, then a nation needs to repent and then the hand of blessing will come upon us. That's the same in any and every life. Uh, a lifestyle of repentance and not rebellion. And I want to cover the issues of rebellion in a moment. In order to, to begin with that, uh, with the difference of rebellion and repentance, I need to go back here where he said, break up your unplowed ground. Now, how many of you know that we were created from the, the ground? Your, everything in your body is a, a makeup of something from the earth and a large part of your body is just water. I think 80% or something like that. It seems like I heard that. I'm not sure if I was taking a nap in class that day or not. But, but I mean, you're just, uh, you take all the water out of your body, there's not much left. He said, break up your unplowed ground so you're made from the dust of the earth. Here's what he's talking about. Break, there's, a, there's unplowed ground in the different arenas of your life. In your thinking, there's some ground that needs plowed and, and, and so, a seed sown and a harvest. And, and in your spirit, in your, in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, uh, within your whole life, 
there's, there's a place for renewal and, and, and fresh seed, new seed and, and new fruit. And, and he's saying, break up your unplowed ground. And, and so that's that part of your mind, your thinking, that part of your spirit that, that is hardened, still hardened. And he's saying, break it up. Just like a farmer would plow the ground with great toil, he would plow the ground and break that hardened earth up so that a seed could be received and so that moisture could be retained whenever the rain comes. And that's what he's saying. Break up that unplowed ground in your life. And for it is time to seek the Lord. That's why we break it up. It's time to seek the Lord till he comes and showers righteousness on you. It's amazing how he uses the natural things of the earth to convey the spiritual things in your life and things that are eternal. And we need to pay attention to these. Let's look at Hosea chapter six, verses one and two. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. This is a very interesting verse of scripture. It continues in verse one. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. You see, there's a time that God is working in your life and, and he's going to tear your little kingdom down. And he's going to tear portions of your life down. It says, he has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. You see, when we're in rebellion, he will start tearing our little kingdom down. When we're walking away or running far from God, he'll begin tearing our little kingdom down and the things that we're embracing so dear and that, that, are, that are only temporal and he'll tear our little kingdom down. But he says, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. And then it says, notice verse two, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. This is prophetic of what Christ did. You see, we cannot save ourselves. We, you are not your own savior. You are not saved by your righteousness, by your goodness. You're not saved by your good deeds. There's nothing you can do that will save you. And some of you are trusting, have been trusting for too long in your good deeds, in your righteousness. You know what is right and you keep putting out all this effort, but you have no idea uh, of what it's like to truly, truly, truly trust God in, in regard to the events and affairs of your life. And you keep wondering why there's a failure when you're so good. Is this all right? Amen. 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 You, you keep wondering why your life is a wreck when you're so good, because you're trusting in your own righteousness. There's only one Savior, and He's not you. He's not me. I'm not my Savior. I cannot be. It said, after two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, now I don't totally understand what this part means, but I do understand this other. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. This is prophetic to the third day of Christ when he was in the tomb and he rose the third day in order to restore us that we could live in his presence. Amen. So if he's tearing your little kingdom down, give him thanks. Give him praise and say, Father, don't stop until you wreck my little foundation. Then you may find a foundation in Christ because, because your mind is being restored. You have broken up your unplowed ground. Man cannot redeem himself. The Bible says all have sinned in Romans 3 and 22, 23, it said the righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned, but the good news, it continues, and we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. The atonement means payment as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. All we have to do is trust in what he did. It's a simple faith, 
but yet it's sometimes challenging because we're trying to trust in what we do rather than trust in what we believe. We know it's by grace through faith, but we still linger in trying to trust in who we are and what we do in our own works. All we have to do is come to him, repent. That means apologize. You know, the scripture said, take words with you. When, you. when you go to God, you take words with you. You say, God, I'm sorry. Speak them out loud. Amen. Amen. I, I learned to pray out loud many years ago. I learned to pray out loud so, so well, and I pray out loud so much, it's hard for me to pray silently. It's hard for me to think. And remember the text said, take words. He didn't say take thoughts with you. He said, take words with you. Go back to the throne. Say, God, forgive me. That's a confession. Forgive me of my sin. You know, it's kind of like if you offend someone and uh, you decide, well, I wish I hadn't have done it. So my thoughts are, I wish I hadn't done it and, and I'll just move on. Well, you may move on, but they won't. They don't. Because you can't take thoughts to them in a form of apology. No one can read your mind, you know. God can, but he said, take, wor take words. Bring words, take words and repent. And it's just like if, if we hurt someone or offended someone, we've got to go to them and speak and say, hey, I'm sorry. I was a jerk. I, I, I was being foolish. And, and, and I had no right to say those things to you. Will you forgive me? That's what it means, take words. So we go to God. You know, if I offend you and I only take thoughts, you'll never know my heart has changed. But if I take words to you, you will readily gladly forgive me and then we both we both move on it's not what you know of God's promise and God's grace that matters it's what you ask of God's promise and grace that matters and, and we need to ask we need to go to God's throne with words and I apologize and then ask forgiveness he said take words with you and then I'll restore you I have so I'm running out of time but let me hurry. Let me try to go through Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by faith. If you're counting on your works, you'll never have peace and you'll never move on. It's by faith you believe what he said, accept what he did. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's all by faith. We, we obtain access into this by faith into his grace. If you don't believe, you won't receive, but if you believe, you can have it. Verses three and four, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Hey guys, you, you've heard me get into this arena in the past. I just want to encourage you Quit getting in the mully grubs, getting all down and out, belly aching and complaining. When you're going through an issue of li in life, give God praise. Thank you, God, for this moment. Because there are all these things are meant for good. All things work together for good to those who love God. You have to love him and be called according to his purpose. And so we rejoice, it says here, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Some translations say patience. And it's amazing how many people like to say, I don't want to pray for patience. But guys, it's, it's by patience that we receive the good things of God. And the Bible teaches us this all the way through. I want to stay with this scripture and not get sidetracked. I have so much more to say. It produces endurance and patience. And endurance produces character. Without patience, you will never develop the character because you'll always be ready to take a shortcut, a, a, a lower road. And character produces hope. Now here's the key, and hope. See, in order to get to hope, you've got to have patience. You've got to have endurance through the time of suffering or you'll get angry at God. You'll get mad. You'll throw in the towel. Uh, you'll pick up all your toys and go home. Hey, I got to throw this out. It may take uh, this. This may take some time, but it's not going to cost you anything. 
it's, a, it's amazing how many times people get mad at, at me or someone in the church or, or whatever, and they take their toys and go home, and, and, uh, and, they're, and they're taking it out on God. Do I have to say much more? I mean, like, are you really knocking his legs out from under him, you know? God, I'm, I'm not coming to church today because I'm mad, I'm upset, and so on. Do you think you're really hurting God? Do you think you're hurting me? Do you think you're hurting someone else? Man, when we trust God, God sustains us. There's been a lot of people that tried to hurt me through the years, but it may have hurt, but it didn't hurt me because God took me and I was able to, to break up my unplowed ground. And then hope, verse five, it produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This shame, this word shame, hope does not put us to shame. It's sin that puts us to shame. Hope, we have a hope in God. We have a hope in eternal life. We have a hope in, 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 the, uh, in the destiny that God has given to us, the plan God has for us. And this word literally means to shame down, to disgrace or to put to blush. Amen. He will take our shame away to the point if someone mentions our sin of the past, we won't even blush. Amen. Amen. No matter what you did, no matter what you did, you won't even blush because he not only took your shame, shame or your sin away, he takes your shame away. And he takes the pain away and you won't even blush. Wow. Wow. I just think that's incredible. That's when we repent and turn God's way. That's what he did with the adulterous woman. You know, he told them, if any of you here is without sin, that's John 8, verses 7 and 11. He said, if you're without sin, let, just go ahead and throw the first stone. They all left. He asked the lady, where are your accusers? And she, she said, there, there are none. He said, neither do I condemn you. You see, Jesus wanted to wash her. He wanted to cleanse her. He forgave her on credit. He had not yet died. He forgave her on credit. Amen. I love that about the Lord. He forgave her. And it was when he forgave her, everyone he forgave, every time he healed, every time he ministered the blessing and promise, it, it was sealing the deal that he had to die because he is in debt to his death because he's already forgiving. He's already healing. And if he doesn't die, this can't happen, but he did it. It happened and he sealed his death with his actions, if you will. And when it came time to die, even though he did not want to, and he said, let this cup pass from me if it can, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And, and it was God's will for him to die because God made a promise and gave assurance. Even back here in the old, in the old Testament through these scriptures, he gave us assurance that, that on the third day, the third day we would be healed. And he had to die. And on the third day, the price was covered. The debt was paid. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Now... I'm trying, to, I'm trying to speed this up. Exodus 23, verse 21. It says, pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. You see, simply put, repent means to stop rebelling. And until we repent, we're rebelling. If we're rebelling, we don't repent. If we are rebelling, living a lifestyle of rebellion, instead of breaking up our unplowed ground and letting God sow into it and bring fruit, seed, fruit, and nurture it, if we're not allowing God to do that, if we're not drawing near to Him, we're living a lifestyle of rebellion and he said, he will not forgive your rebellion. He'll forgive your sin. 
But if you're rebelling and say, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to stay here and just keep doing this and, I, and I'm not going to listen to what, if it's rebellion, he says he won't forgive our rebellion. It means stop rebelling. And then our text said, Hosea 14 and 2, take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously. And he will. And he will. And he does. This is my last scripture. Psalms 51 verses 10 through 13. The scripture has spoken to me since I was a teenager in such a way I've never released it. I always hold on to it. And it says, create in me a pure heart. Oh God, that's our prayer. We take words with us. You know, it's not just words of saying, oh God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. But David took these words to the throne. He said, create in me a pure heart. And I believe they were inspired by the Spirit of the Lord. He said, create. This, this prayer was prayed. These words were spoken after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he had her husband killed in battle. And then he took her to his wife. And it was in rebellion. But now, after the child is born, the child dies. And... Uh, he says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Doesn't matter what you have done, if you'll take words with you and return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. He said, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. What is he saying? He's saying no matter what you've done, if you'll return to the Lord, take words with you, ask him to forgive you, and pray the right prayer such as create within me a pure heart. Then, David said, then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. David said, because of what you have done in me and what the scripture is saying and conveying, because of what he has done in you, no matter what your past has been, your life is redeemed now and he will use, he will utilize you. He redeems you. He restores you back to his design. He redeems you. And now literally, whereas you were the transgressor, now you're redeemed and you teach transgressors his ways. Whereas you were the sinner, you've been redeemed. And now because of you, sinners are turning back to God. Isn't that amazing? Let me invite you to stand. In repentance, there are two key parts in accepting Christ as Savior. One, we just accept him as our Savior. But secondly, we must make him our Lord. Accepting him as Savior falls into the realm of grace, we're accepting something we don't deserve and something we haven't earned. But then we make him our Lord and that means no more rebellion. Oh sure, you may sin, you may fail, I know that, he knows that. But you keep returning, returning and, and breaking up that unplowed ground so that he can put something back into it, something into that part of your life that, that, you, haven't, that you haven't had fruit in and, and we just keep returning. And no matter who you are, you still have unplowed ground. And, and so I, I just want to encourage you in closing, break up that unplowed ground, that hardened earth, that has that hardened part of your heart, your spirit, your mind, that part that is, is so hardened and you thought you didn't need to change. You thought in that part you didn't need God's help. In that part you already had it covered. You were the master of it. But he's saying, break it up and let me put something into it. And let it take root and grow. In Romans 10, verse 9, he says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So in doing this, we accept Christ as Savior and we make him our Lord. I want to lead you in a prayer and if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've never claimed and professed him, professed him to be your Lord, you can do so right now. And I want to encourage you to pray 
Pray out loud with me. There's, there's, he didn't say take your thoughts to him. He said take your words to him. There's something about speaking it out loud that makes a dynamic difference spiritually, emotionally, and so forth. But if you'd like to pray, just follow me. Pray the words I pray or pray something similar and follow me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe you. You are the God of eternity. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the lover of my soul. And I believe you. I trust you. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, your only begotten son whom you sent to this earth through a virgin named Mary. He came as a baby. He became a man and he gave his life for my salvation. He gave his life as a sacrifice so I could be saved. I accept Jesus as my savior and make him my Lord. Jesus, you are my Lord. And Father, I will serve you the rest of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from my shame. Deliver me from my pain. And I surrender my life to you. I will serve you until you call me home. To you I render all glory and all praise with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, give him praise. If you prayed that prayer, give him praise.